This is coverage of the American Society of Clinical Oncology Symposium on Gastrointestinal Cancers. I'm Joe Ilya from the NEJM Group. We've assembled a small team to help guide our coverage of the symposium, among them three clinicians, Ghassan Abu Alpha of the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and a professor of medicine at Weill Cornell Medical College in New York, David Ilson of the Memorial Sloan Cancer Center and also a professor of medicine at Weill Cornell, and Axel Grothy, director of GI cancer research at the West Cancer Center and Research Institute in Germantown, Tennessee. Thanks so much for helping guide our coverage. So we've seen a list of the abstracts and topics to be presented, but we don't have access to the actual materials yet. So in the absence of that, we're having a preliminary chat before the symposium opens next week. So let me ask, what are the developments in GI cancer you're most looking forward to hearing about at this conference? Gassan, let me ask you. Well, thanks so much for having us, Joe. And this is quite exciting. It's a little bit different uh, that we are doing all of this uh, meeting, upcoming meeting in virtual way. But nonetheless, we look very much forward. There's quite a bit of action. And we anticipate now that we uh, uh, at least have a read of uh, the abstracts that will be coming on. From the hepatobiliary perspective, uh, it's quite fascinating to look at the reflection of the busy years that uh, just uh, passed through uh, from 2017, 18, 19, and 20 uh, with the advents of uh, therapies in regard to hep cell carcinoma. And it will be nice to see some reflection in regard to uh, the application of the different first-line and second-line therapies. And understandably, the two big questions that remain is what is the sequential, uh, best sequential approach being where do the checkpoint inhibitors plus minus uh, TKIs uh, and then follow TKIs or TKIs to be followed by checkpoint inhibitors. Um, it will be nice to see if any data will reflect further on that. Another one which uh, also remain quite important to us is uh, in the biliary tumor, uh, the application of the next generation sequencing and the application of the different therapies that uh, are pertinent to the different alterations, uh, among which uh, those that uh, we were all heavily involved in, FGFR2 fusions, uh, IDH1 mutation, and many others. And it would be nice to see what are the further understanding of those from the perspective of who are those patients, how do they behave otherwise, how do they relate to chemotherapy, et cetera. Uh, and of course, a little bit rare diseases, but nonetheless very important. Fibromyalgia carcinoma always on our uh, heart and mind because uh, it really affects very young uh, uh, people, uh, uh, sadly, uh, all over the world. Uh, and uh, they are not that many in number, and sadly, there's no standard of care for. And it will be nice always to see what the uh, uh, meeting might uh, show us in regard to uh, how to further help our patient with fibromyalgia carcinoma. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, David, w what about you? Were, are you looking forward to uh, to, to developments in, in, in any area? Yeah, I think, I mean, uh, the GI symposium you know, is multidisciplinary. We always look forward to it every year. Uh, where we uh, get uh, input across the you know, GI specialties, gastroenterology, surgery, uh, medical radiation oncology. And uh, uh, I think highlights uh, from the abstract listings this year include uh, a potentially practice-changing trial of a new targeted therapy approach in esophagogastric cancer. Uh, you know, we now have validation for use of HER2-targeted therapies and uh, now uh, the advent of immunotherapy in esophagogastric cancer. But uh, now that we're doing uh, next generation sequencing and more broad genomic profiling, we have identified other potential targets. Uh, and we're all looking forward to one of the most important presentations, which will be uh, looking at uh, a targeted therapy for the FGF receptor, uh, the drug bimertuzumab, which is a monoclonal antibody blocking the FGF receptor. Uh, it's one of the uh, pathways that's uh, either amplified or affected in esophagogastric cancers, probably in about 5 to 10% of patients. And uh, uh, this uh, was reported, the trial of bamertuzumab combined with first-line chemotherapy in patients with uh, FGF uh, gene abnormalities. And this was reported as a positive trial, meeting its primary endpoint of improving overall survival. So we're very excited to potentially hear of a new pathway that might be targetable uh, in patients with advanced metastatic esophagogastric cancer that harbor 
uh, FGF uh, gene abnormalities. Okay. Uh, we're also uh, going to uh, uh, hear uh, some important updates uh, 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 in adjuvant therapy in gastric cancer. Uh, although the approach in the West is perioperative chemotherapy uh, and gastrectomy in gastric cancer, uh, in Asia, where you know 90% of the gastric cancer is treated and, and uh, for which we have a lot of data for the benefits of adjuvant therapy, there'll be update uh, of an adjuvant therapy trial from Japan, uh, which uh, really validates the use of adjuvant combination chemotherapy after gastrectomy and gastric cancer. So we're going to hear survival updates about the trial that looked at combination therapy with docetaxel and the oral fluorinated pyrimidine S1, as that's a new standard of care in Japan for adjuvant chemotherapy in patients with resected gastric cancer. And we're going to hear uh, updates on that very important uh, trial, which uh, uh, was really practice changing in Japan. Um, and uh, I'm also looking forward to um, hearing uh, presentations on some quality of life data from uh, some of the upfront immunotherapy trials. Uh, uh, we're going to hear uh, updates of uh, quality of life uh, outcomes in some of the uh, early line immunotherapy trials that uh, these were recently presented at uh, the ESMO meeting, uh, the virtual meeting uh, in the fall. Uh, which were practice changing, indicating uh, a likely earlier line use of checkpoint inhibitors in not only metastatic esophagogastric cancer, but also potentially in the adjuvant setting. So uh, 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 we look forward to uh, uh, look, hearing about some of the secondary endpoints, uh, quality of life of patients treated on these pivotal uh, immunotherapy trials. Uh, and then there are a number of other presentations uh, that we look forward to hearing. Uh, but uh, to me, I think it would be uh, the uh, uh, update of secondary endpoints in the immunotherapy uh, arena now that these drugs are going to move into first-line therapy in appropriately selected patients. Uh, and um, uh, the uh, data for the uh, FGF drug, which may be practice changing uh, 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 depending on uh, uh, what the, what the uh, benefits and results are. Uh, and uh, uh, updates uh, from uh, adjuvant chemotherapy and uh, gastric cancer, which uh, uh, certainly are have led to a change in practice in Japan. So as always, it's a very uh, exciting meeting. It's global. Uh, we uh, get uh, uh, important contributions from the uh, U.S., Europe, and Asia, a uh, very collegial uh, uh, group, and uh, uh, very exciting. And uh, we look forward to hearing the data and seeing the presentations. All right. Uh, Dr. Axel Grothy, in the colorectal er uh, region, which is your specialty, uh, what, what are you looking forward to hearing about? Yeah, so I, I like to see ASCO GI or the Gastrointestinal Cancer Symposium as a kind of a standing on the shoulders of the ASCO meeting in 2020 and the ESMO meeting in 2020, which really showed a lot of advances in GI oncology. ASCO in 2020 really had a lot of emphasis on colon cancer, rectal cancer management, uh, which really changed standard of care actually half a year ago. Um, it also is really a testament to the fact that even though we were challenged, you know, to get together, communicate, you know, uh, new data, cancer doesn't wait for COVID. And so we, I think we're able to really um, move the field along in spite of all the challenges, have interactions, really influence guidelines and uh, FDA approvals, regulatory approvals. So what I anticipate and what I see from going through the abstracts for ASCO GI is a couple of themes which are similar to what David actually just mentioned, refinement of the data that we've already seen from published or presented studies, you know, subgroup analysis, secondary analysis, quality of life, you know, a trans a translational data, which can help us really refine patient population that are uh, candidates for personalized therapies, targeting certain molecularly defined subgroups, but also immunotherapy, the role of tumor mutational burden, you know, as a marker with, to identify patients who might benefit or not benefit from immunotherapy. Um, that is, I think, an interesting aspect. We see some data about novel treatments or repurposed uh, treatments that we've seen so far, um, which might influence, let's say, not, it might not be practice chain, but can, can inform our practical approach for patients. But when I look at it from a more, let's say, a bird's eye view perspective to look at themes. Where are we going? You know, where is this whole field moving? There are, I think, three areas which I would highlight, you know, which could be of interest for a more general audience too. Number one is the 
goal of circulating tumor DNA as a marker of minimal residual disease and a marker of you know, treatment monitoring over time. You know, we have to use tumor markers like CA, C99 for a long time, but those are they're not very specific. Now we're detecting DNA fragments of tumors, really individualized uh, tests, you know, which are highly sensitive, highly specific, which are being integrated in clinical trials and in potential clinical practice approaches. And those that's actually an area which I think is going to transform the way we identify patients for adjuvant treatment, not just in colon cancer, but also in other diseases, breast cancer, lung cancer, upper GI cancers. So that is really something that is transforming medicine at this point in time. Another set of uh, abstract deals with screening, population screening for cancer using these fancy technologies that I just mentioned, circulating methylation marker, mutation markers, etc., to eventually come to the holy grail of cancer screening, let's say one blood draw a year, and you can forego on colonoscopies or upper endoscopies or pap smears to uh, really do comprehensive cancer screening. That is coming to our door very, very soon. These data are quite interesting. There are various abstracts that, that are really in the field of colorectal cancer, including identification of adenomas, pre-cancer lesions, you know, with blood-based testing, which I think is fascinating. And the third theme that I see, which is interesting, they kind of accentuated in the era of COVID, is social and socioeconomic and racial disparity research, which I think is really one of the themes that has emerged over the last one or two years. We have talked about this before in various cancers, in particular prostate cancer, breast cancer, but now it's moving into the GI world more and more. And I think this whole aspect of access to care, healthcare disparities is, has been accentuated by the COVID epidemic you know, which really ex uh, kind of exposed some of the flaws in our healthcare system and which definitely in in affected cancer, actually uh, cancer treatment. And now there's actually, when I look at overall, the whole um, area of, you know, ASCO GI abstracts, there's a lot of COVID involved. I mean, it seems to be right now, the easiest way to publish a paper in a journal is to put the word COVID in the title, whether or not it's related and uh, then it's an easy way to publication at this point in time. So there's a lot going on and uh, I highlight and I, I kind of uh, second the, the, the excitement that uh, Gassan and David have for the meeting. And also it provides us again a forum to interact on an international basis because cancer is international, it's an international problem and we all in this together to, to really make a difference. Uh, cancer is international and so is this pandemic. And I was going to ask you to what extent the pandemic has disrupted treatment uh, plans uh, in, in your areas. And, and uh, in GI cancers, it's had an impact. I mean, uh, 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 you know, patients coming for, you know, courses of radiation therapy that could stretch uh, daily treatments over many weeks. Uh, fortunately, we had the advent uh, at the start of the pandemic of uh, potentially shorter treatment schedules for delivering radiation therapy in rectal cancer. It turns out short course radiation, five treatments, probably has the equal uh, efficacy uh, as longer therapies. So uh, there definitely has been an impact. Uh, uh, you know, uh, early on in the pandemic, we did the best we could to try and avoid uh, patients coming in as much as possible, trying to do oral chemotherapies, trying to do shorter courses of radiation therapy, uh, some surgeries were, were uh, uh, delayed uh, for patients because of the pandemic. And uh, uh, so it definitely has had an impact uh, uh, on our ability to deliver care. I mean, I think we've been able to maintain uh, quality of care and delivery of care, but it's definitely had an impact. And then patients that get COVID, they get their therapy interrupted and have to recuperate. Uh, uh, so I think uh, uh, it's uh, actually had an impact on uh, treatment guidelines, uh, certainly that have been even uh, published in Europe and the U.S. Uh, alternative strategies to come to cope with this situation, really to minimize patient risk of exposure, to uh, potentially streamline or make treatment safer and uh, easier to administer. 
um, and uh, as I said, uh, the timing of a recent publication of data for short course radiation uh, therapy and rectal cancer couldn't have been better timed. <laughs> Uh, uh, rather than having patients go for five or six weeks of radiation, they likely get the same benefit for short course. Uh, but uh, obviously now with the advent of va- the vaccines, uh, we're hoping uh, to, uh, to achieve some uh, a greater degree of normalcy uh, later in the year. Okay. Uh, listen, I want to, uh, Gassan, did you want to say something? Yeah, I would like to add, thanks so much, David, for bringing this up. And I would like to uh, hear... Uh, bring in a very important perspective is that uh, uh, understanding COVID can have an impact, but uh, we at Memorial uh, uh, published, uh, and Elizabeth Robilotti from Infectious Diseases uh, was the lead author on uh, an effort uh, published in Nature Medicine back in August 2020, that after all, uh, by all means, uh, did spell out certain contributors to a uh, worse outcome in regard to having cancer and COVID-19. But uh, the pertinence in regard to GI malignancies was rather limited. And it's very important to really stress this out to our colleagues that after all, uh, COVID-19 is not necessarily a sole limiting factor in regard to therapy. And in other words, giving chemotherapy because we need to for patients because of certain malignancy with COVID-19 uh, is not a no-no. We are doing it. We are practicing it. And by all means, the data have shown that it's totally appropriate to do. Okay. Yeah. Let me add one point, I mean, which I'm worried about is the decrease in screening colonoscopies that we've seen with the uh, advent of COVID, you know, when, you know, routine colonoscopies were delayed, deferred, not done, you know, patients missed their appointments because they were scared or they couldn't go. You know, we also need to keep in mind we have a lot of providers now who test positive for COVID who are taken out of the equation for 10, 14 days, you know, nursing staffing, you know, our chemotherapy nurses, et cetera, were affected by that. So this has disrupted um, our, uh, our, you know, practices in many different ways. And I have patients who died of COVID. I mean, this is, and, and patients who can't get into the ER or stay in the ER for three, four days in the ER room because they make it out of the lobby for, not out of the lobby for 24 hours. I mean, this is all much more dire than people might think, you know, and we, and I really hope that, you know, that we are able to administer the COVID vaccines more rapidly and prioritize cancer patients too, because, you know, that's a recommendation from all our um, and medical societies, whether it's ACR or ASCO, which said, you know, cancer patients need to prioritize in spite of the fact that cancer patients were not part of the clinical trials that led to the approval of the COVID vaccines. But we know this makes a lot of sense. We recommend flu shots to patients on chemotherapy. So we should recommend a COVID shot on patient, <clears throat> for patients. And I think we need political awareness of the need, you know, that these cancer patients have that they get at least prioritized for this, let's say, second round of the rollout of the vaccines. Uh, thank you so much. I, I want to respect the uh, the clock, and I know that you all have busy clinical schedules, and I want to thank you so much, um, um, uh, Axel and uh, Ghassan and, and, and David, for, for talking with us uh, today. And um, we look forward to having another conversation at the at the end of the conference thank you so much again sounds good Thanks. good to see you guys yeah very nice Take care. bye-bye